So I first I first knew Kara because of her positive reinforcement training that she does. Um, and then we also found out that we have a common denominator and that we both have air fern horses that need a little extra help. Um, yes. Around regulating the smorgasbord of food that they shovel into their gullet extremely quickly. Yep. Yeah. So the first question actually is very fall related. Um, and it involves um, mud fever and thrush prevention. So not specifically like laminitis, but hook adjacent, close nice. to that. Feet or feet. And what are, what are some tips for um, helping mitigate um, mud fever or scratches or pasture and dermatitis and thrush prevention? And mainly you have to kind of keep your horse's legs and hooves as clean and dry as possible. Super challenging, especially yep. if it's really muddy where you live. Yep. Um, I recommend clipping extra fetlock feathers off because then things dry faster. You can spot little scabs easier. You can also use these um, Winnie Wellies, which are actually like rain boots for horses to cover wraps and keep mud. And I know it's so crazy. <laughs> I've never heard of those. Oh my gosh. I actually, I have a video coming. Um, I just edited it this morning. Um, but I have a video about them because they are, they're absolute genius. They've got really, really tough, um, a really tough closure. And you can get them lined or unlined depending what you oh need. Gosh. That's so cute. Um, love that. So I love that, especially if you have a super sensitive or has medication or a wrap on that you need to stay protected. Um, yeah. The other thing about mud fever is like, I really encourage people not to um, not to shampoo or dish soap the horse's legs because you want to keep as much of their natural oil on right. the skin because that's the antimicrobial stuff. Right. Um, right. And then a good diet. So yeah. you, you also live in a potentially muddy, long, tall grass area. Yeah. We have a lot of, my horses are on 40 acres. <laughs> so yeah. And it gets bush hogged every like two or three months, um, in the summer. So it's tall. It's, um, there's a lot of dew. There's, mm -hmm. they have to walk through a low spot that mostly is always like a little damp, um, sometimes more than others. So, um, now my two horses really don't get that at all. Um, I don't know if it's because of their superior nutrition because I spend <laughs> more on their nutrition. Um, than I do my own sometimes. Um, they're also draft crosses, which I tend to be a little hardier, but Finnick has one white leg. And I know a lot of times the white legs tend to be more prone, but Wells actually has four white legs and a mostly white body. And he, the only spot he gets any of that stuff is actually on his nose. And I think it's a combination of sun and dew that makes yeah. that happen. Um, but I, don't have it on my guys. However, the horse that my husband rides, he um, gets it on his one little white fetlock. And so um, with that, it's just, you gotta, you gotta be real consistent. And we do, we'll do clipping. Um, we'll try to keep it dry, but he's out 24 seven. So I use the really thick zinc. That's kind of my go-to. And then if mm -hmm. it gets really bad, um, like an infection, obviously I'm going to like pull in the vet, but if it's just the little scabbies, um, if I can keep zinc on it consistently, then it usually will go away or at least not like explode into something. Right. So yeah. that's kind of, I thought, yeah, kind of my, my guess. It's so thick. It creates like this natural barrier and you don't have to look for right. zinc, but you can just use diaper cream because it's the vast right. majority of zinc. So people always ask me, one, how old is Miguel? Two, why does he wear a grazing muzzle? And um, three, what does he look like when he's running away with you? Um, I don't have any video of him running away with me because I'm usually too busy screaming at the top of my lungs for him to stop. But I can tell you he is 30. Um, and he wears a grazing muzzle because he is an air fern. So even... Even being adjacent to food, not necessarily ingesting it, he just packs on the pounds and it's better for their joints, especially when you're 30 years old. 
Um, and it's better for your thermoregulation and your metabolism mm -hmm. if you are not a giant tick. So he wears that and he actually wears it year round. So you also have a horse besides your model that has that as well. That wears yes. one. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I, am, I muzzle each of them for different reasons. So um, Finnick is my younger horse. I raised him from a baby. He's a draft cross, but he's kind of short and he's kind of built like a bulldog and he is a super chunk. Um, you can ride him bareback and still have big dressage thigh blocks, um, because of his chunky shoulders. So, um, he wears a grazing muzzle for weight management and also just because his breeding makes him really prone to metabolic issues further down. Um, I mentioned earlier, he's out, um, 24 seven on, uh, 40 acres of Kentucky bluegrass, which is not the ideal diet for really any horse, but especially, a short chunky draft cross mm -hmm. so um he actually wears one of our grazing muzzles with our diet insert which is like a new thing that we have that actually restricts more than um than this guy it mm -hmm. uh it pops right into the bottom and it makes the holes a little smaller which is perfect for him so he can still go out get tons of exercise play and interact with his friends but not blow up um and possibly get laminitis or any other myriad of metabolic issues. Um, and then my other guy, Wells, is a big paint uh, draft cross, and he's kind of tall and lean. He doesn't have a weight problem, but he has a digestive problem. Oh, so right. when there's too much sugar in the grass, um, he super struggles to di digest it and he gets the squirts. And so um, yeah. the muzzle allows him to eat and still like maintain his weight, but not um, have that like leaky hind gut stuff going on. And he's on lots of supplements and other things for that. But um, that plus the grazing muzzle helps him to maintain a healthy everything. So please send us questions comment with your questions because Karen and oh, I yeah. will go off topic and we will be talking about the most like insanely paint drying, boring stuff. Miss Iguana yeah. says, will you link this? And in my bio, you can go to, um, you can go directly to my website and I've got all sorts of coupon codes and articles and resources about everything that has to do with horses. And I have coupon codes for what Kara is decorating a horse with right now. Um, and then there's a question. Do yes. you have these in draft sizes and small pony sizes? So there is a large horse size. Um, All right. <laughs> depends on, it depends yes. on the circumference of your horse's mouth. Cause I've seen big draft horses that have like a pony, pony lips. Um, but there is a pony size. I know that. Kara is the expert on that. Yeah. So yeah, so we have, this is our mini size and this is our pony size. Um, this is our horse size and my draft cross is where the horse size. Um, we are working on a bigger size for like your larger draft crosses, warm bloods, full draft horses. So that is uh, in production. Now, that being said, there are things that you can do to this one if it's too small. I have mm -hmm. tips and tricks and I, I can know. walk you through modifying this to make it work um, for a much bigger horse if if you really need it um, and if you're a little handy. Um, but as this is, it would fit most horses that take a six inch bit. Um, it will fit my, another horse that I had before, he was like a six, six and a half inch bit and he wore one of these with no issues, um, okay. other than I would cover the back with our pony protector stickers or right. our, um, like a little gorilla tape or something like that. So, yeah. So, yes, um, all the sizes and more to and come. Green Guard's YouTube channel has, has like bucket loads of all sorts of videos of Kara. Um, basically engineering the muzzles for every sort of situation you could possibly imagine. Um, I think, I think you have a background in like industrial design or something. No, just horsemanship. <laughs> um, no, 
just I just oh, like yeah. setting things on fire and then cutting them up and putting them back together. <laughs> About, I specifically want to talk about also laminitis in the fall. Um, I guess it was, I guess it was, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, I saw up close and personal, like a horse that I know develop laminitis. And I knew about it. Like, I'd be like, oh, it's, you know, I've heard about this thing that happens. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, this is really bad. This is super duper really bad. So ending laminitis and really educating about laminitis has always been something that I've been super, um, like, super into. Is it a pet project? I don't know. It's such something I'm curious about, and I like to share information. We have two things working against our horses. One, we have crazy weather, which makes crazy stressed grass. So... Colder mornings, stress the grass out, sugars and starches go up. Hot afternoons, stress the grass, sh sugars and starches grow up. They're getting ready to go to seed because it's winter time. That's gonna increase the sugars and starches. Um, and then maybe you don't turn out as regularly because there's mud or there's this or there's that. So combine that with what happens inside a horse's body during the fall. And this to me is really, really fascinating. Um, Horses need to prepare their bodies for winter. They have to grow a winter coat. And also they like to pack on some extra poundage because it is thermoregulation for them. And um, the way they do that is by changing their natural hormonal system. And they start increasing the amount of cortisol their body produces, which actually helps trigger the hair growth. But it also interferes with insulin and glucose regulation. Fall, crazy, laminitis risk can go up for some horses. There you have it. Oh, talk about exercise 23 year old horse, especially in hard winters. Okay, just kidding. I'm going to switch tactics there. Um, so to me, that makes me think that you have a harder keeper in the winter. Um, and as far as that goes, um, I really recommend um, not stopping exercise because it's kind of like use it or lose it as far as like muscles and joints go and for when horses are older it's really important to kind of keep them moving and keep maintaining their fitness and all of those things um however if you're you know if it's hard to keep weight on them or it's like a tough winter um that's when i would work with a nutritionist i'm a huge fan of beet pulp without the molasses i just add that to my ration balancers and that way i can um, feed the same thing to all my horses and then just use the beet pulp to make something higher or lower calorie for the different ones that have different needs. So that's an option there. Um, and then as far as like, if it's winter and you don't want to ride, there's lots of stuff you can do that's not riding. Take your horse for a walk, take him for a hike, um, walk them over like different surfaces. That's really good for their proprioception as well as just like general fitness and it's enriching. It's kind of fun to explore things. Um, I'm the queen of like all the groundwork things because Wells is not in a place where he loves to be ridden all the time. So we're doing most of his fitness from the ground right now. Um, but if you can ride, do that too. But um, you don't have to like go big in the winter. You can just walk and, you know, look at the, <laughs> look at the snowflakes or whatever. Um, you don't have to like be doing a Grand Prix, like jumper course every, every time you get on either. I think some people think they have to ride and like ride for an hour or it's not worth it, but it is get on for five minutes. Totally worth it. So that's what I got. Cool. I hope that answered the question. Um, all, right. all right. Another question came in about the thoughts on feeding haylage. Is hay safer or better uh, for a regular sport horse? Um, and for me, haylage, there's always a risk because there's moisture involved and that can lead to mold. Um, mm. I don't want to feed my horse anything that's been wrapped because you don't know what the moisture content was, one, before it was wrapped, and two, if it's wrapped, is there a hole where moisture's gotten in? Um, because then you have that mold botulism kind of rip. But I do recommend if haylage is something that is one of the only options in your area to make sure that your horse is vaccinated for botulism and maybe some other 
bacterial type infections and your vet can help you with that. And then follow-up question, hi Bella. What's your favorite form of added forage in the winter? Hay pellets, cubes, et cetera. Um, I don't have to add any forage in the winter because the air fern, like he just, he just exists and gains weight. But for uh, harder keepers, I definitely recommend using a blanket to help them retain the heat that their bodies generate by eating the forage that they get. Um, you can mm -hmm. find um, additional calories in the form of not necessarily a ration balancer because those typically only add vitamins and minerals and leave the calories out of it. But you can find feeds that have extra calories. Rice bran adds a lot of calories. Beet pulp adds calories. Um, if your horse needs to chew a lot, cubes and pellets are fine. They're great. They eat cubes and pellets a little bit faster than they would long stem. So it depends on if you have a slow feeder system that you could put pellets in. I have a slow feeder, Miguel eats pellets. Um, and I have a prevents slow feeder and it's basically like a big round bin and it's got a bunch of like little cups in it and the feed sticks in the cups and he has to like, he has to like do the nose thing and like really, really work around to get it out. So I like those if you're feeding smaller pieces of food. Um, I have one of those too. And it's yeah, like, cool. it's a, it actually, it's a plate that sits down in any bucket. And so oh, it's like yeah, a reverse a muzzle. Yeah, yes. it was really yeah. handy. I got it last year because I had a, a guy that wanted to choke on me. So <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Um, another good source of calories for horses is like a different kind of hay. Sometimes the legumes like alfalfa and clover have more calories than the grass hays. Um, I think I mentioned the brands are the rice brand. I don't necessarily like wheat brand because it can throw off the phosphorus balance in your horse. Um, and then you can add like cocoa soya, like an oil, um, yeah. to add a little bit of calories too. Um, but again, I think when you find a way to increase your horse's forage and calories, if you pair that with using a blanket to help them keep the heat in, they're not burning so many calories to stay warm. And that makes their whole eating process a little bit easier. Um, and also like, I know a lot of people don't like blankets. Um, I happen to love them. I think they're fantastic. It saves me so much time and energy in grooming. I'd rather do laundry than try and groom yes. my horse in the winter. <laughs> that's all I, I that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> that's um, fair. That's yeah. fair. Oh, and then we have a comment. This is a great, great. comment. Um, Somebody uses rice bran for their OTTB and they love it. And he's starting to gain weight. Um, mm -hmm. I think also for a lot of horses that are off the track, just having um, a mental like quieting and that, that lifestyle change where they go from that hustly bustly area to like a more chill kind of even killed environment. I think that can help them gain weight as well, uh, yep. which it's fun. And I, I do really, really love a good thoroughbred. Like nothing, nothing will ever beat a good thoroughbred. Except for it's maybe terrible. a horse that is as delightful as a thoroughbred, but has, uh, has more uh, breaks. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I want a horse that's going to be a small break. thoroughbred that like, likes to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my gosh. But uh, my the horse that my husband rides is a thoroughbred and he he just turned 20 this year um he was born wow. and bred on the farm where I keep my horses and came back sound and so my husband rides him and he has lots of breaks until you get him past the point of uh once he starts cantering and gets all warmed up then he's like he's gone man but oh, my yeah. husband rides him in a bitless bridle so he's he's good So question about blanketing. So what blanket would we recommend for a six month old Tennessee Walker? And boy, I wish I could answer this, but I gotta tell you, I, I cannot. Because um, I don't know where he lives. I don't know what his winter coat is like. I don't know what the weather is like. Um, but generally speaking, um, 
a horse's winter coat is going to take care of their needs in in their environment. I will say there obviously are huge exceptions to this. Um, a horse that maybe doesn't have a lot of sebum on their skin that's not very waterproof might need a rain sheet. Um, a thoroughbred or an Arabian that was you know, very thin skin, very short hair is probably not going to do really good in Canada being naked, in which case a blanket is appropriate. Um, but I do want to mention that, like, there's a myth out there that you can see if your horse is cold by touching their ears. And that's not a very, like, it's not a very scientific way of finding out if your horse is cold because your hands could be really hot, like, I don't know about you, Kara, but when I go to the barn in the winter, my heater is on high for 45 minutes straight. I want to be dripping sweat when I get to the barn in the winter. And so I'm like basically on fire. And if I touch my horse's ears, of course, they're going to be cold. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But yeah. If I touch his ears after I've been like scrubbing buckets in 20 degree weather without gloves, my hands are going to be freezing and I'm going to touch his ears and they're going to be really, really warm. So yeah. You want to be sure that your horse is comfortable. So it sounds like they live in an area with lots of snow. Um, it lots sounds like they live in an area with lots of snow. So thank you. Yeah. It, yes. So lots of snow. So in that case, I would blanket for water protection if necessary. And especially, you know, with a young horse, because they have that weird coat they're born with, and then there's that weird shed, and then they like, Maybe at a year old, they start to actually be like an adulty type horse with a normal hair coat. I might, I might blanket um, for water protection. And then I would just make sure that um, their body temperature stays nice and even and they are not losing any weight. Um, and it's really easy to track their, check their weight with the weight tape. It doesn't have to, you don't have yeah. to know what exactly what, how many pounds or uh, kilograms your horse weighs. You just need to be able to say, I weighed him this way, and next week I'm gonna weigh them exactly the same way, and you just track the chins up or down. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, and then also, you know, if you're worried about them getting chilly, especially at night, slow feeders, lots of hay. Lots and mm -hmm. lots of hay, slow yep. feeders. Um, You had somebody ask you the other day, Kara, about using a muzzle for hay eating, didn't you? Yes. Um, and we get this question fairly frequently because a lot of times there's a horse that like needs to be turned out with other horses and they need less hay and the other horses need more hay. And um, this was not designed for hay. However, a lot of horses can do just fine getting hay through here. One of those horses is my horse Finnick. He um, he can get hay through his grazing muzzle, even if it's in a hay net. Um, now oh he is God. very persistent and he's also very practiced at using his grazing muzzle. Um, if you have a horse that isn't used to it as much or isn't as like aggressive an mm -hmm. eater, they might struggle a little bit more, but you can't actually teach them. Um, the easiest, if you want to use this for like a wearable hay net um, or if you need to slow one horse down and not impede the others from getting hay, um, the easiest way for them to eat it is either from like a round bale where it's kind of like held in place um, mm -hmm. where they can like kind of get it stuck in there <laughs> and nibble yeah. it or um, loose on the ground or loose somewhere like in a hay feeder or something like that. Um, most horses can figure it out and you can actually teach them by like just grabbing like a handful of hay and you just kind of like stick it up in there <laughs> and then slowly work your hand oh. down to the bale or the pile of hay or whatever. Um, we have a picture, a very dramatic picture of my horse in the winter, still needing his grazing muzzle because he's still real fat and still on 40 acres of Kentucky bluegrass, yep. but eating his hay through a muzzle and, and there's just like hay, like crumbs and dust puffing everywhere and he's got his little like fox print rain sheet on um it's yeah it's pretty epic so yeah it's it can it can be used for hay not what it was designed for and it might not work for every horse but we also have a trial period so if it doesn't work for what you want it for 
let us know and we'll either help you or whatever. That's, We've that's also had people really ask good. if they can use it for like feed, but, um, oh. and that's a, some, some horses can, can get pellets through it, like hay pellets, especially if they're in like a wide pan mm -hmm. um, or like a wide like feed uh, bucket, I guess, as long as it's yeah. big enough to fit their, fit the muzzle in, a lot of them can do that too. Yeah. Um, got a question from Savannah who says, where is this muzzle from? And it's from Green Guard. And again, if you didn't join us, I don't know, many minutes ago, um, on my website, which is linked through my bio, I have a whole page of coupon codes if you guys need to get on there. And there's a coupon code for that yeah. muzzle as well. Um, So I, I love that muzzle, but I, what I love more is the halter because that thing is amazing. Oh, yeah. It is amazing. Well, one, the color. You yes. Just, I can't eat it with the colors. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, we also, we have it in pink um, and black. And whoop. so nice. what makes our halters really awesome is this slider buckle that adjusts the throat latch short yep. or long so that mm -hmm. it can fit back behind their jaw bones and make it really hard to pull forward over their head. So this is like our super Houdini halter. And then also this center face strap here helps keep yep. it, the muzzle from like pulling down forward um, yep. and supports, supports it on their sensitive little nose. Um, I know a very naughty little pony, shocking, it's a pony, super smart, and like even wearing that muzzle and that halter, he's like, watch me get this off. So his owner let his mane get really long. He's retired anyway, so it was kind of like part of his shtick to have a really long mane. And she just puts a fat braid in it and then puts the crown piece through the braid as well. I, like, you gotta I love that. that. I love that so much. I have a um, a video on a like, for the super, super, super Houdinis, I have a video tutorial on how to pair this halter or any halter actually, any halter with a neck strap in mm -hmm. a, um, using actually like repurposing our muzzle straps to attach it at three points of contact to make it really extra Houdini proof. And for oh, okay. the people that have like told me their horse can remove anything and I've sent them this video to try, I haven't had one of them come back and say that they were able to pull it off. So oh, I, I might've okay. found the the ticket. So I, I do lots of experimenting, so. Uh, opinions on net covers, I've heard of several accidents mm -hmm. with them. Um, and so. I haven't, um, but I also like to make sure that like everything my horse wears has a way to escape their body. So I don't like really, really strong buckles on my blankets. I don't like turbo, you know, turbo connections. I don't like any nylon head collar. I only want to break away head collar. And it's the same for me with, um, with a, a neck cover, like if it gets hung on something, I want it to be able to like pull away. So any Velcro that attaches it to the body, I just kind of keep it looser. Um, but I also think a lot of horses get into accidents because they meet the fence or a fence. Um, so it's important to me that, that horses have a reason to stay away from a fence and that is either hot tape or there's a lot of food in the center of their turnout or their paddock that keeps them occupied and yep. not near a fence. Um, I also like to have aisle ways or walkways between paddocks so that horses can't start to do stallion wars and stuff over the fence lines. Um, Cause I do think horses, especially those that are um, yep. turned out together, they have a tendency to be like, I'm going to chew this and I'm going to pull it. Or, and when they start to do that over fences, oh, yeah. sometimes it gets a little bit 
questionable. So that's that's my thoughts on but also like horses get into accidents without neck covers because they exist. Totally. Um yeah. Horses I so, feel like can get into accidents with any equipment and uh -huh. so the like the breakaway thing, I think that's like key is, yeah. is that yeah. you want whatever equipment your horse is wearing, you want it to break before your horse would break. Um, oh, 100%. So I actually yeah, 100%. had a blanket, a horse come in with, I had a horse come in without a blanket and it had a net cover attached and I found it out in the field, perfectly inside out, not one strap undone. How? I, aliens. I knew a horse that would be aliens. Olympics and that would give us that every morning we'd show up. And if we didn't get his blanketing exactly right, he will have taken it off in one piece. I don't know how he did it, but like he did it. If you've seen any of Kara's yeah. videos, oh. she has trained her horses to put the muzzle on themselves. Like all she has to do is hold it. And they're like, Ooh, I'll wear that. Yes. So how did you do that? And then pardon my video dream here. The way that I did that, um, is being really consistent and pairing the putting on of the muzzle with a food reward. Um, and it doesn't have to be something sugary that they're not like, allowed to have because a lot of grazing muzzled horses shouldn't have high sugar things. Um, but like a, you know, a carrot or whatever, something they like, if you introduce them to their grazing muzzle with a treat in it, they're going to see that muzzle like a bucket. You know how every horse when they see a bucket, they're like, ooh, what's in the bucket? We want them to feel yeah. the same way about their grazing muzzle. So especially if you get it before it's time for them to wear it, and you just drop a treat down in there and feed it to them um, out of the muzzle and do that for a little bit, then start attaching it to the halter, put it on a couple times, take it right back off, and introduce it really slowly over time. Um, they will start to associate this with something positive. And even if you eventually get to the point where you're not putting a treat in it every time, they're still going to have that link in their brain of, ooh, this is like something good and there's something, might be something good in there. Um, so that's something that I do and I still do use, like I'll pop a, a treat in there or a piece of carrot or even just like a handful of grass, I'll just like shove it in the corner just as a like, way for me to say like hey thank you for being really good about putting this on and then also for Finnick he knows that the muzzle means I get to go out and graze he does pretty much not ever does he get to go out without it on so for him it's almost like a good thing because it means like ooh, playtime um recess <laughs> so that's something else but not every horse is going to be wearing it 24 7 or like every single time they're out on pasture. Um, but just being consistent with that. And then even once they get it really good, like just continue to reward every once in a while or, you know, as regularly yeah. as you think about it to kind of keep that fresh. Cause like if you have a job and you get paid for it and then all of a sudden you stop getting paid for it, like you're gonna be less inclined to do that job. So, you know, um, that's something that's really helpful and it, it makes my life easier mm -hmm. I I so yeah like do yourself a favor make it easier and like do a little bit of like a lot of like really positive associations really early on build that reinforcement history and then you'll have created a really strong association with this and then it'll be smooth sailing um for the rest of the time that you need it but super consistent really early on so I didn't do any of those things with Miguel but uh you know over time, he just figured out the routine. Like, I get this put on my face, I get to go out on the grass. And now, like, now he'll time you. He's like, you are exactly 39 seconds late. And, you know, he'll, he is really good about just making that connection. And I think reinforcing the connection between the muzzle and being allowed to have pasture, that's what the horses understand. They understand that boundary. Yeah. And I think I think horses and people get into trouble when 
oh, well, you know, it's like I didn't want him to wear it today. Like I felt bad or whatever. Well, it's sometimes that teaches them that, you know, you can be manipulated. <laughs> and then it becomes horses training people. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a whole other that's a whole other thing. You have me here and then you have Kara, who's like the behavior, the training, the barn hack woman. Like, yes. if when zombie apocalypse happens, I, I want to be, I want to be with Kara. I have a great like. <laughs> but okay. there's something that I am really excited about for my own horses going into mm -hmm. the fall. Um, and that is that our, we have these like super cool insert things that like pop into right. the bottom of the muzzle and they can restrict more grass. But the thing that's, I think is really cool about them is that you can use them. Cause a lot of people ask us like how to taper them or if they should taper the muzzle on or off when it's wow. like, cause a lot of people don't muzzle through the winter. Um, and so yeah. This is such an excellent tool because you can like use this one during the really like bad yeah. high sugar grass yeah. times um, and then switch to the regular one, yeah. which um, has holes that are the same size as like these holes um, as a way to like taper mm -hmm. on and off. And then I actually, I have one of these, the diet ones where I actually cut the holes just like a tiny bit bigger with an exacto knife because I thought this was like maybe a little too aggressive, but actually I found it's exactly what Finnick needs right now. Yeah. <laughs> but so I have my like diet, this is the super diet. And then I have like a medium diet and then I have a regular and that will allow me to like taper on and off to like the grass is like really intense right now. So he's gets like mm -hmm. super diet and then I'll like taper to the like medium diet, which I made, but it's really easy. And I, have a video so just hit me up uh at gg-equine.com and um and then i have the, like the regular one which is just like the same size holes but i like it because it like protects the bottom of the muzzle and it also makes the surface a little thicker so it makes it a little harder to get grass um which right. finnick absolutely needs but and he also has sensitive teeth so this is helpful for that too I will also mention um, something horses can get really frustrated if the grass length is not um, compatible with the muzzle. Like grass that's really, really short, they're going to get frustrated mm -hmm. because their lips can't grab it through yep. the thickness of the muzzle. And then grass that's really, really long will actually like fold over yep. and it's hard for them to grab. So it is important to keep your pastures mowed, which incidentally also helps reduce the number of ticks in your pasture. So you got that going for you too. I mean, you might be fresh hogging a little more often than you want to, but um, like fewer ticks and less frustration and then your pasture stays nice and even, even and everybody wins, everybody wins. I was just gonna say that like, if your grass is really long, they can learn to eat. If it's too long, it just makes it a little more challenging. So yeah. like, if you're trying to teach them how to use the muzzle, I recommend something that's like four to like eight or 10 inches long. That's like all the same length. That's the easiest for them to figure it out on. But once they figure it out, sometimes if you're in like taller grass, which like, I agree, I wish mine got mowed way more regularly than it does. Um, but they can figure out how to eat through it with the taller grass, but it's much easier to learn if it's right. like all manicured. We've got another question. Are you getting, are you reading the one that I am about a big move coming up for an 18 year old dressage horse going from Calgary to North Carolina? Oh, Calgary to North Carolina. Um, never had such a long haul looking for recommendations. Oh, dang. Oh yeah. So I moved my horses from West coast to nice. East coast and flew them because I I didn't want to be driving a rig and I didn't want them to be on a rig for that long amount of time. But many horses can do long distances and using um, an omeprazole paste product before, during and after the shipment, which is the like gastric guard or ulcer guard. 
they're the same product, just different dosages. So your vet can help you with that. Um, I recommend lots of electrolytes and I recommend doing your research on who's hauling them. If you're hauling them, great. You can take all the time you want. Um, some long awesome. distance haulers will actually do layovers for a couple of days where they can be on the ground and like stretch their legs and do all sorts of good stuff. Um, also welcome to the East coast. North Carolina is very, very nice. Um, they might yeah. still be having like the, like, Really, really hot August weather right now. Um, so that's going to be definitely different from Calgary. Um, anyway, yeah, it's a transition. But luckily, horses figure it out. And when you provide them with, like, lots of planning up ahead and preventative care and then supportive care during the trip and then lots of downtime and transition time when they do arrive, it can go really, really well. Like, you just have to do your research on who's hauling yeah. for um, and flying with horses is really fun. Like it's bananas fun. It's, it's so cool. Um, so if you, if you, if you get a chance to do that, then you should do that. Um, and I do know that like Tech Sutton that flies all over and they fly like all the race horses and stuff like that. They land in Lexington, Kentucky all the time. Um, and I flew my guys to Lexington. All right. We laid up there for a couple of days and then we continued on, and then I pulled them um, into Virginia. And that was wild because we were going to have just one day in Lexington. Um, and then this, like, the most wicked band of thunderstorms, like, all along my highway route was red blobbies for, like, 12 hours. And I was like, I am not, I'm not hauling two horses through red blobbies for eight hours. I'm not. So then we got to hang out in Lexington for an extra day, which was really fun. Um, somebody's asked, is it affordable to fly? And I don't know. Um, it's, it's been a long time since I flew horses. Um, I do know that like plane tickets for people right now is crazy expensive, um, but it's an option and you don't have to fly yeah. in the whole a new part way um but it is mm -hmm. it is totally it's totally yeah. amazing but definitely if you're whatever kind of hauling you're doing talk to your vet before long before weeks before to get a, a medical plan and do some preventative care and um i definitely wouldn't be feeding any grains or anything like that when they're traveling i would just stick to forage only um and make sure they're getting it 24 7 um but yeah, that was crazy. Mm -hmm. Now I haven't flown a horse overseas. I've only seen them get loaded on those big boxes and lifted up in those giant forklifts into the belly of like a, <laughs> you know, seven forty seven. Um, I flew Tex Sutton, and they are I think they're um seven thirty sevens, and they basically just gut the entire back end of it. The whole fuselage is just gutted, and they walk the horses on and line them up and they build the stall around them from the back of the plane to the front. It is, it was wild. So they walk them from the trailer. They literally go right off the trailer, up the ramp, into the plane, down to whatever row they're going to be on. They turn around and the guys like build the four walls of the stall next to horse, build the four walls. And then they just keep moving forward. It's, it was so cool. It was so cool. And then, oh my God. Yeah, I know. I was able to like, you know, walk around the horses and um, check on everybody and make sure they all had food and water. But they also, there were like six or seven grooms on that flight with me monitoring the health of all the horses. It was, it was like chef's kiss first class. So you got it was to fly with them. Yes, I did. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, I know. That's, oh, that's really yeah. cool. Lexington mm -hmm. to most parts of North Carolina is, you know, cool. anywhere from like four, four to 11 hours, depending on <laughs> which mm -hmm. end I'm, I grew up in the mountains, so I'm fairly close. Um, but if you're closer towards the coast, it could be more like eight to 10 or 11 hours, but yeah. But there's, um, also, there's also layup that's really cool. everywhere. Like there's a whole network of people that have, yeah offer overnight boarding just 
or, you know, a couple of day boarding where you can just go and lay over and like, let everybody chill out for a little bit. Um, yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to the East Coast. I would think for going that far, I would think for going that far that like flying might be comparable, especially if you're taking, if, you know, they're taking their time, the cost of like haulers or just gas or the time. And then if you're like doing, I'm assuming you'd have to have some like layover um, that mm -hmm. can add up pretty quick. So I would maybe not comparable, but for the time, at least worth it. Right. Um, I know like for hauling for me, my big thing is like, if they can't have a box stall, just having the ability to like lower their head and like clear their, um, Name. their nose yeah. out every like couple of hours. That's the reason a box stall is so important. Cause if they can't put their head down, a lot of times they get just like all that like gunk and stuff built up in their, their nose, their esophagus, like whatever. But I know putting them, being able to put their head down and like, cough out the the gunk is really important every you yeah. know four hours or so you're I <laughs> so think that sounds about, really gross but no you're talking about shipping fever and it's something that horses can get it is a bacterial yes. infection it is a form of upper and lower respiratory infection like a pneumonia type um and they call it shipping fever because it happens when horses are shipped even for I, short amounts of time you know it yeah um and you're totally right. Like horses eat on the ground and when, or at ground level, sometimes it's not good for them to eat on the ground if it's sandy. Um, and that allows those, their respiratory system to clear itself just by the sheer act of dropping their head. But if they're in a shipping situation, they can't do that. And then they have this like buildup of all the goo and stuff and then they can get infected. And it's called shipping fever. So please check your, check your horse's temperatures every day, but especially if you've been traveling with your horse. And there's, there's a reason that like I clean my horse's bit and grazing muzzle every single day. It's because of the goo. It is because of the goo. Um, just, you know, I don't do a deep clean of the muzzle every day, but it gets rinsed every day. Yeah, I do too. Um, yeah. I just, I'll just like dunk it in a bucket every, every day. And then if it um, smells funky, I'll like do a little more, but the smell <laughs> test is really, you know, that's where it's at. You're just like, if it smells a little funky. I mean, that's with everything, your saddle pads, your <laughs> grazing muzzle. <sighs> honestly, honestly, that was like my first year of marriage. I'm like, why does everything smell like not me? <laughs> right? Gross. <laughs> and now, oh boy. I guess yeah. so now it's like um because i feel like i'm i'm like um immune to the smells of the barn so if i'm gone from the barn for a couple of days and i come back i'm like god where what is that yeah. i'm like oh i smell it every day i just like you know i i tune it out like it just it's become nose blind at that point this is great this is a really good question what are some good ways to make flatting your pony more fun for the horse? Mm. Food rewards. <laughs> it's actually not a lie. Um, no. I, I really like changing the terrain and, and it could be changing the footing mm -hmm. and it could be changing the incline. And I definitely recommend, um, trail riding like I can I cannot stress this enough like trail riding yeah. is so beneficial for all horses you don't have to do gallop and canter and trot stuff but trail riding is just a good chance for everybody just to take a deep breath and like exhale and be like oh okay this is really nice I like this um but yeah you have tons of ideas of what to do uh oh yeah I've got all kinds of all kinds of things, but there's so many ways to change it up. Even if you don't have like trails, I mean, just like mm -hmm. to, and you know, if you can ride like outside the arena and like find like, okay, how many different surfaces can we walk over? Like pavement, gravel, sand, grass, mm -hmm. mud, um, all those things are like, not only are they good mentally just to like get your horse, like kind of out of this, like plodding around in the sandbox, 
thing, but also like physically, um, it's really helpful for your horse to develop um, just like different feeling for different types of things with a, a rider on their back. Cause um, you know, most like injuries happen because they're doing a thing they didn't train for. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big group. I love the different footing thing. That's huge. It's so good for your horses, like proprioception and like balance and all that stuff, especially if you do it like under load, um, by load, I mean like a rider <laughs> with weights. <laughs> um, and so. now that we're coming up, I know a lot of us are not always going to have footing outside of the ring um, to work on because of bad weather. But that's the time if you are in the ring, this is when I like to do stuff like I like to do Cavaletti, but I also like to play games. And like forever and ever ago, I did, mount I did mounted games. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to do that exactly right now but i'm going to do the same principles and do the same pattern work and have those same interactions in a ring now and that's helpful when outside the footing no good yeah yeah um i love all right. to do like scavenger hunt type things where they have to like uh, if you uh, get your horse like teach them like okay if you go to here then you get a treat and then you go to here and I'll I have little like they're not cones they're like the little plastic disc markers and mm -hmm. at each one they'll get a treat when they go to so that's like a fun way to like build a pattern um and then you can do it on the ground and kind of teach them the pattern and then do it mounted um that's just like a fun motivating way to like get your horse to do different stuff so I guess now's a good time to tell everybody also where you can find us. You are Kara. Oh, yeah. At how do we yeah. find you? So I, me personally, I'm um, at Musgrave Equestrian on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and mm -hmm. and what the work that I do with um, Green Guard. We are at gg-equine.com on the internet um, and then GG Equine here on TikTok and also Instagram. We have Pinterest, we have um, Twitter, uh, YouTube. <laughs> if you wanna see mm -hmm. videos of me like doing all the hacks <laughs> and like sometimes even hilarious things on the TikTok, give us a follow. Um, it's a good time. <laughs> uh, it really is. And if you guys like this, please send us a message because we can definitely do more of these. Um, Kara is an expert in so many other things besides um, what we've been talking about today um, and is a really valuable yeah. resource for building relationships with your horse and core strength and having fun and really exercising outside of the box. Like there, it's very yeah. rare that I see you actually riding. Um, <laughs> that's boring everyone uh, rides I know why would you do that um, so anyway I want you guys to use these resources that are here send us questions um, you know I'll answer any questions Carol will answer any questions with videos and we'll just go from there so you can find me at proweeklinegrooms.com and again I have a whole shopping section on the website up top in the main menu, which will take you to coupons and specials and all sorts of information. Or you can just go to my bios in wherever all the socials also. Um, and we'll do that. Um, so that was really good. We've been yammering on for an hour. Um, yes. Thanks to everybody who came. And I think, I think I'm really good, but definitely let us know if you guys want to do this again. Um, yeah. All right. Oh, Melvin says thanks so much for everyone joining us. So I'm going to sign off. Follow Kara. Follow me. Send us all the questions, and we'll see you guys maybe soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Talk to you later.